Have you ever wondered what God thinks of when he thinks about liberty? That's what we'll talk about today. Free will is not the liberty to do what one likes, but the power of doing whatever one sees ought to be done, even in the face of overwhelming impulse. There lies freedom indeed. George MacDonald. Today we're going to talk about liberty. It is July 4th, and I love liberty. I'm a big fan of how liberty is expressed in our government and how our founding fathers thought to make liberty an important issue. But liberty is a little bit different when you think about it in sense of Christianity. I think the first liberty or freedom was the one that God gave us. He says, you don't have to follow me. I want you to follow me. I hope you love me. But you have free will and the choice to do what you decide to do. Doesn't mean there won't be consequences, but you have the freedom to do so. That was the very first liberty that was given. Joseph was set free from when he was sold into slavery. We have lots of examples of places in the Bible where people have been given freedom. But the question is, as Christians, what does liberty actually mean? And of course, we have passages in the Bible. John 8, 32, we are offsprings of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Jesus answered them, truly I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave. Romans six eighteen, having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. It's intertwining of those two words. Second Corinthians, now the Lord is the spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Galatians 5, this is a big passage that we're going to talk about later. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not again submit to the yoke of slavery. What slavery is he talking about? He's talking about the slavery of sin. That's a big image that we have. I see a lot of people who think that when you become a Christian, you're the slave. You have to do all these things that God tells you to do. You have to do all the things that the church tells you to do. And so you're not free thinkers. You're not free people. I'm a free person. I can do whatever I want whenever I want to do it. But the truth is, is we all pick someone who's going to rule our life. And if we pick God, we are free. We're free from sin. We're free from death. And we're free from the consequences of the sin and death. A lot of times I look at someone who's addicted to drugs, and I've met many people who have been addicted to one drug or another, and they think of themselves as free. I'm free to do what I like when I like to do it. And the truth of the matter is, the drugs have enslaved them. Maybe their sinful living has enslaved them. Their partying lifestyle has enslaved them. And they think of themselves as free. They're not really free because that sin that enticement has them. And I think that's really where the devil is in the details, so to speak, is the fact that we all have weaknesses. We all have things that we could fall to. Can I have a huge lineage of alcoholism in my family? Drugs, alcohol could have a grip on me very easily because my genetic code makes me more capable of becoming addicted. I did the 23andMe addiction and it said if I smoked, drank, took drugs, I would most likely do so to excess, not free. And then we also think about doing what God says. Is that freedom? Is that what we should be aiming for? And a lot of people scream freedom. I have the freedom to do this. I have the right to do that. And in most cases, I agree with them. However, in terms of Christ and the freedom to act, Are we acting in the way that Jesus would want us to act? We're free to do it. Our salvation might not depend on us doing it because it's not taking us away from God one way or the other, but is it the way that God asked us to live? And in that sense, we're trying to free ourselves from sin and instead are becoming entangled in sin by standing on those I have a right statements. I love the fact that our founding fathers in the United States wanted to give us freedom, decided to tackle what it meant to have freedom. I enjoy that quite a bit. 
But Paul in Galatians, starting out right away at chapter 5, says that we are children of a free woman. You know, we're using that analogy of a family. We are inheritors of the kingdom of God. Chapter 5 says, For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not again submit to the yoke of slavery, meaning against to sin. We're not supposed to become slaves to sin, slaves to this urge that we have to live the way we want to live, but instead be connected to Christ and live the way he wants us to live. It goes on to some conversation about circumcision, you know, whether or not you decide to get circumcised or not because you want to be bound to God. But what you're doing is you are trying to justify yourselves more by doing an action. The justification by faith has already been completed. There's nothing more than we can do if we decide to get circumcised, and that's fine, one way or the other. But if we say that that's the thing that's going to bind me to God, you're wrong because there's nothing you can do about it. We have from the Spirit, from faith, he says, that we wait for Jesus to work faith through us in love. It has nothing to do with whether we're circumcised or not. And every time we tack on law, To our behavior in that sense, we're saying that we're not justified. Again, it's not that you shouldn't act or do a certain thing. It's that you're basing your salvation, your relationship to God, on an action. That's never going to be the case. So then he goes on in chapter 5, verse 13, For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So that is freedom, freedom to serve God. It is not the sense of I can do what I want when I want to do it because God has set me free. This nation has set me free. We are expected to live by the Holy Spirit, live for Jesus Christ. And he said later, let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. It's, you know, fruits of the Spirit. When we have the fruits of the Spirit, this is said a little bit earlier, by the fruits of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, and against such things there is no law. You cannot rule people and tell them you will be generous, you will be patient, you will have joy. You can't order people to do it. Instead, it's a fruit of belonging to the tree of Christ. And as we look to be free, because we want to be free, I think most of the world wants to be free. But the question is, what exactly is it that we're supposed to be free to do? And that means that we're supposed to free to belong to Christ, that we're supposed to act for Christ, not because the acts will save us, but because the acts are out of love that we have for Jesus, that our faith isn't empty, that we do the things that God wants us to do because we love God. I mean, imagine if you just got married to someone and I said to my future husband, well, now that I'm married, I just want to let you know I believe I'm a free Christian, which means I can sleep with whoever I want to do. I can do whatever I want to do because I'm free. That wouldn't be what it is you need for a marriage. No marriage would stand with that kind of opinion. You do these things because you love God, because you love your spouse, and your freedom is found in love. It's not found in behaving badly. That is not a freedom at all. And what if my husband came back to me then and said, you will cook me my meal, my favorite meal, every night for the rest of my life? Well, what if I don't want to do that? So now we have an issue of obedience between the two of us. I can say that according to the laws of this nation, but also according to the laws of God. That's not a part of what God has asked me to do. In fact, Jesus very harshly spoke out about the Pharisees who took God's law and added more and more onto it. If you don't know, for example, in the Talmud, it would say that you're supposed to keep the Sabbath. Okay, we get that. We understand what the Sabbath is. But when I was growing up, I was told that I was supposed to just sit there. I wasn't allowed to play with my toys. Maybe I could play with my toys, but I couldn't do certain things with them. My grandmother said technically I could read, but I wasn't allowed to turn the pages. Or I could turn the oven 
on to cook a meal, but then if I did that, I couldn't turn it off. This is not in the Bible. It's not anywhere in the Bible. Then people ask the question too, well, when exactly does Sabbath start? So then a bunch of rules came. Well, when there's three stars in the horizon, that's when Sabbath begins. Do you think God really intended when he asked us to rest and keep the Sabbath, he was looking for us to come up with a rule so that we do it exactly right? Jesus said the Sabbath was made for us so that we can rest. And if a person rests by reading, if a person rests by cooking their favorite meal for their family, then there's nothing to it. But because the Pharisees were really into building rule on top of rule on top of rule, that's where Jesus had a problem with the Pharisees. Now suddenly you're not free. Just like if I said you must get circumcised, you're not free. You're free to make those choices because they're neither moral, they don't have moral implications about them, and they somehow build a rule to make sure that Sabbath isn't for us, that Sabbath is just a set of rules we're trying to keep, not turning the pages, not turning off the oven, all sorts of things. Did you know there's kosher ovens that after X amount of time will turn themselves off? Now, looks like a safety feature, which it totally is too, but it also is so that someone could turn on the stove, cook a meal, and not turn it off and have it turn itself off. Really interesting. But we'll never get God's acceptance by cooking the proper dinner for our spouse or by not turning pages on Sabbath. These are all rules that are being put out there artificially when the only rule is to accept Jesus and to know that our salvation is in his work of death and crucifixion. When he overcame death, he overcame our sin. And so now we're free from death, from sin, but that we no longer pay the consequences of what we did. And in the end, that is exactly why Jesus came down, because there was no way we were ever going to, under the old covenant, save ourselves. There's no way we could do all the do's and don'ts in the Bible that God expected us to do. Even if we stuck to the main ones that would show up in a red letter Bible. We fail at that too. We're not always kind to our neighbors. We're not always nice to other people. We don't always do things in love. We're going to fail at that. And that's exactly what grace is about. Grace is being forgiven for what we've done. And if we start saying that we have to do X, Y, and Z, we have made ourselves slaves to the old law again. We are trying to earn grace instead of receiving grace and getting it from God alone. So that's when Paul says we shouldn't take on the yoke of slavery again, meaning you have been set free from the law. Don't put yourself under the law again. Again, not telling yourself to go out there and sin away because you're now free to do whatever you like. You're free now to serve God. Become a servant to other people. So we're looking for freedom and liberty. We have the freedom, again, for joy and holiness, for life, for knowing God. So now we're free to love each other. And even Paul in 1 Corinthians 9.10 says, Though I'm free from all, I have made myself a servant to all. He didn't have to be a servant, but he went to the Lord and said, Let me serve you. That is the ultimate choice of freedom is when you take your freedom and you give it to someone else. And who we should be giving it to is God, because he is the one who paid for everything, who paid for sin and death and all the things that go with us and gave us everlasting life. So there is our real liberty, is that we're able to just give that freedom that God paid for us and give it to Christ. Other passages in the Bible that you're probably familiar with, for example, Luke 418. This is red letter, so it's Jesus saying it. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has appointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of the sight of the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. I believe at this point, this is when Jesus goes back to his hometown and speaking in front of the synagogue that he grew up in. What he's saying when he's talking about the poor and the blind and even the other parishioners 
at this temple. Previously, you didn't have choice. And now you have the ultimate choice, the ultimate freedom to follow me, to have everything that God promised you in Eden, to have the promise of salvation, the promises of heaven, and everlasting life. You were poor, you were enslaved, but now you have the ultimate freedom in me. Boy, that must have made people's jaws drop when he said that in his hometown of Nazareth. At that point, that's when they tried to kill him because they realized exactly what it is he's saying about who he is and who his father is. Not Joseph, not the carpenter, but God in heaven. His father's will is the creator of the universe. He's freeing us to have a relationship with God. He's giving us the freedom to be with him forever. We're escaping the wages of sin. We're escaping the guilt. And the idea is that we're supposed to have peace, that we're supposed to have joy, all the fruits of the Spirit, because God has sent us free. And so essentially, he has just freed everyone who has ever sinned, which is everyone except for himself. We have all sinned, and we have all done things that we shouldn't have done. And we're no longer to be slaves of that sin. We're delivered through Jesus Christ, as it says in Romans 7, that we're supposed to be set free from our sins, and that Christ's righteousness has now been given to us. The burden of the law is no longer on us, meaning nothing happens to me when I turn the page of the book that I'm reading on Sabbath. But again, we have to be cautious about it. Because as it said previously, what I mentioned in Galatians, we don't want to use our freedom to indulge in the flesh. Jesus told the woman being stoned, go forth and sin no more. We always remember that first part where he stops her from getting stoned. But then the second part, go and sin no more. It's John 8, 11. So with our freedom, we're also given a responsibility. And when we have a responsibility, We want to do what God wants us to do to experience the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And like it says in Romans 8.21, For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope, that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain freedom of the glory of the children of God. God wants us in the end to be free. He wanted freedom for us. And we chose the path of slavery, slavery to sin. And Jesus came back to set us back on the right path and make sure that we have the true freedom that Christ gives. So in this time of the 4th of July, yay, freedom. It's complicated to explain, but that also means that we should have the discipline, the attachment to God to follow him and to become a servant to him. It's a complicated message. It's a lot easier to think about freedom than it is to think about what exactly it means to be a free Christian. So my challenge to you is think about freedom, of course, during this holiday of freedom, and what it means that we're free in this country, and the country hopefully you belong to as well. Follow God. What does it mean in our freedom? How is it we should treat other people? How is it we should love other people? And it goes a little bit with the last two podcasts where we're loving God, we're loving other people, and now we have the freedom to do it properly because God gave us that freedom through Jesus Christ. All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate listening to the podcast. Please remember that you can always email me with any prayer requests you have, or if you think I got it wrong, let me know. Again, I'm thinking in December, somewhere around the 1st of December, we're going to start a Bible study where we're going to go through a chapter a day. This is going to be a deep dive. This morning in church, our sermon was about Ruth and Boaz, and we had questions, so we started looking up. How old was Boaz? Maybe he was 80. And was he married before he met Ruth? I mean, this is the kind of deep dive we're going to do in this Bible study. Right now, I'm working on a template so that every episode of this podcast, we will go through 
a chapter of the Bible. Again, I'm not going to read it to you. The idea is that you're going to read it before that chapter is due. And then we're going to talk about what happened in that chapter. It's going to have a template. So every single podcast, we're going to follow the same guidelines to talk about every chapter. I suspect it's going to take about three years to go through the Bible. So again, if you have an idea of how this should go, if there's something that you would like to see in this, let me know. My email is jill at smallstepswithgod.com. And remember, the path towards freedom to do the right thing with God starts with small steps. <music>